Okay, um, so my doctoral research on the archaeology of late medieval book fittings was undertaken to develop a better understanding of this particular material culture, which has previously been overlooked in the study of the late medieval book. Given the largely organic composition uh, of books, the survival of pages uh, and bindings in archaeological contexts is particularly rare. Yet the metal fittings of book bindings are archaeologically visible, and these have been found on a large number of sites. So there were two particular uh, aims that my research sought to achieve. Uh, the first was to uh, develop a comprehensive typology of late medieval book fittings that had been recovered from English monasteries. The second was to consider this particular form of material culture in its wider social and cultural context through its analysis in conjunction with uh, supporting evidence. So today I'll summarise some of the key areas of this research, beginning with a brief overview of previous approaches to the study of the late medieval book. I'll then discuss the archaeological material I analysed and the various approaches that I applied in order to achieve both typological and contextual studies uh, of this form of material culture for a better understanding of book fittings and the medieval book. So numerous studies on book history, paleography and codicology uh, offer varying attitudes to the study of the book. Finkelstein and McCleary offer an up-to-date guide to the field of book history, providing an introduction to the development of the book and print culture with discussions on the history of the book, orality to literacy, literacy to printing, authors, authorship and authority, printers, booksellers, publishers and agents, readers and reading, and the future of the book. This field of investigation considers the development and cultural significance of the book throughout history. Uh, rather than the book as a material object in itself. So for the study of the more physical aspects of the book, one can turn to the fields of paleography, codicology and also archaeology. However, the uh, definitions and applications of these terms have long been contested. So paleography is the study of the history of scripts, their adjuncts and their decipherment through the reading of handwritten texts and documents, uh, often with the aim of dating and localising undated manuscripts of unknown origin. However, scripts are only one important element of a book that can tell us about its history. In his paleographical study of Gothic manuscript books, Derelay, for example, recognises that alongside the analysis of scripts, the other physical characteristics of medieval books must also be studied. Codicology is defined as the study of the physical structure of the book. It's considered that the examination of a book's structure allows the interpretation of its method of construction and its place of origin, and can aid in the reconstruction of its original form. So Derelay considers the relationship between paleography and codicology, stating that paleography is a specialised field within the broader discipline of codicology, as it investigates only one aspect of a book's composition, specifically the script whereas codicology encompasses the study of all physical as uh, aspects of the medieval book. For the study of the nature and history of the book, De Lacy similarly considered the term paleography to be misleading. But he also argued that codicology, a term created to encompass a wider scope than paleography, is still limited to scripts and texts and excludes the history of the book. It's argued that all material aspects of medieval books, including techniques involved in their production, need to be studied in relation to each other in order to understand their historical significance. And this approach has been defined as the archaeology of the medieval book. So whilst there are differences in terminology when studying the book as a cultural phenomenon, it's clear that different approaches can be made depending on the particular aims of the investigation. It's evident that an interdisciplinary approach must be applied where this type of material culture is analysed and subsequently interpreted in conjunction with other forms of supporting evidence to further understand the cultural significance of the book in the late medieval period. Previously, manuscript books have been uh, considered to be archaeological finds, and that for a comprehensive study, one must analyse all the physical elements of the book, from its scripts and illustrations to sewing structures and bindings, in order to interpret its wider significance. However, extant medieval books are not the only form of material culture then, that can enhance our understanding of the physical aspects of books and their wider social contexts. The analysis and, and interpretation of archaeologically recovered book fittings is an important yet largely unexplored approach to the study of the book, and it's this particular form of material culture that formed the basis of my research. 
So prior to my work, only a handful of studies, um, which I've listed here, um, have analysed book fittings, demonstrating how the study of this material culture can enhance our understanding of late medieval books and their bindings. Perhaps the most significant study that solely and comprehensive, comprehensively catalogues and investigates book fittings is Adler's classification um, and analysis of book fittings from German-speaking countries, the Netherlands and Italy, dating from uh, the early Middle Ages to the present. It's clear from these studies that continental Europe, particularly Germany, the Netherlands, France and Italy, has a, a rich corpus of books with their original bindings and fittings compared to England. However, in England, there's an abundance of archaeological material which has previously received little attention. And it's for this reason that the material uh, was used for my research. So there have been no previous attempts to develop a typology of late medieval book fittings using the considerable quantity of English archaeological material. Excavation reports and archaeological catalogues generally group together objects of the same material. And so the various types of book fittings are often overlooked and some are misidentified, generally as belt fittings. So as I've mentioned, one of the key aims of my research was to develop a typology using specific terminology and stylistic illustrations that would allow for the simple identification of book furniture. So the main source of my uh, material was uh, the substantial collections held by English Heritage. The material held in archaeological stores across the country is primarily de uh, derived from large-scale Ministry of Works excavations or clearances on site from around England during the first half of the 20th century. From these collections, I recorded and identified over 200 book fittings from English monastic sites. Due to the nature of the recovery of the English heritage material, these objects have little specific associated information. Consequently, um, I gathered over 100 additional uh, fittings that have been published in reports of more modern excavations and monastic sites to enhance my assemblage. Mm. So for my typology, the artefacts were initially divided by function, resulting in two main types of book fittings. By doing this, it was possible to distinguish and classify fittings that would have been used to keep books closed when not in use, which are fastenings, and those that protected the covers, uh, which are furnishings. And these two functional types were then subdivided into further types based on overall form, and each of these were then split according to variations in shape. The creation of a database of uh, fittings and their subsequent classification allowed for the in-depth analysis of the physical characteristics of this type of material culture. The full analysis of this unexplored material provided the opportunity to gain a better understanding of the nature and use of late medieval book fittings. I was able to explore the forms and functions of different types of fittings that were used, the materials and methods of manufacture, and the various techniques and styles of decoration. So this analysis demonstrated the many and varied forms that book fixtures took. It recognised the principal mechanisms through which fashionings uh, functioned, namely the strap and pin and hooked mechanisms, and their key variations in form. Similarly, this analysis um, demonstrated the main purposes of the different types of book furnishings that were used on late medieval book bindings, including uh, domed bosses to protect the leather and textile covers from abrasion, and corner pieces and binding strips to uh, protect the very edges of the covers. So among the more common types of book furniture that are found archaeologically in, in England, the two types of strap and pin fastenings that you can see on the left the hooked fastening in the top right and the domed box furnishing in the bottom right corner. So the archaeological analysis of such fittings in conjunction with the examination of previous literature, contemporary depictions, sculptures and extant medieval bindings help to provide information on, on the chronology of these forms. Although the dating of the particular uh, types of fittings is particularly difficult and riddled with pitfalls. The evaluation of the use of decoration and lack thereof uh, on different types of book furniture found that a number of techniques commonly used to decorate metalwork, uh, particularly dress accessories, during the late medieval period were also used to embellish uh, book fittings. It's identified that the, common, uh, the most common uh, technique used on this particular type of material culture was engraving, 
but this was often used in combination with other methods such as punching or stamping. It was also evident that certain designs and motifs uh, were used on different forms of book fittings, particularly on the more common hinged and hooked fastenings, uh, which we've got a couple of examples here. Uh, and furthermore, the investigation into the symbolic meaning of monograms uh, that we used to dec decorate some of the rarer fittings found that the use of the sacred trigram, which you can see just on this top right hand one here, um, it demonstrates a reference to the name, uh, the holy name of Jesus and its associated cult, which was uh, at its height of popularity in the late medieval English society during the 14th and 15th centuries. To move beyond simply defining uh, late medieval book fittings, the second key aim of my work was to undertake a contextualised study. In order to investigate the wider social and cultural context of book fittings within late medieval monastic society, uh, documentary and pictorial evidence, extant late medieval book bindings and library catalogues were examined in conjunction with the archaeological material. To give a clear understanding of this material, I also investigated late medieval book production, monasticism, and the types of houses, uh, the types of books that were housed uh, within medieval monasteries, and the locations in which they were used and stored. And all of this demonstrated the importance of books and the written word within late medieval religious life. So, using this supporting evidence, I was able to explore a number of avenues in order to contextualise the archaeological material. These notably included an assessment of the types of books that, uh, on which fittings were used, the influences of different monastic orders on the use of book fittings, the geographical distribution of the different types of fittings, and the significance of their deposition, particularly as part of the dissolution of the monasteries. So by examining previous studies on monasticism and surviving monastic library catalogues, it was clear that throughout the late medieval period there's a considerable range of books that were being produced for the religious sector, which for a long time took place mainly within monasteries. In addition, the investigation into the technology of book production provided an insight into the various processes involved in this craft. This research, however, found that there's very little direct evidence for the production of book fittings themselves. Both documentary and archaeological evidence um, provide a general insight into the production of metal artefacts during the late medieval period, which can uh, be used to a certain extent in understanding the production of book fittings. However, the materials, production methods, decorative techniques and styles can be indi indirectly determined from the analysis of the fittings themselves. It is evident that the majority of book fittings studied for my work are principally made from copper alloys. However, there are instances where iron has been used alongside, uh, mainly uh, to produce rivets and black plates. The two principal techniques used to uh, produce these copper alloy objects were casting and forging with a hammer, which was followed by filing and rubbing to produce the uh, finished surfaces. Secondary decoration was typically created by engraving, stamping, punching and blind drilling the surface of the objects and also, in some instances, through the application of additional materials, such as gold, silver and enamel. Despite this assessment of, book production, of uh, production of book fittings, it wasn't possible, given the lack of evidence, to determine potential makers or identify locations of manufacture. So an ob objective of this work uh, was to determine if it was possible to associate the different types of book fittings with the books that were used within monasteries. Given the often extensive and diverse nature of monastic book collections, the significant paucity of original late medieval bindings and the varied nature of book fittings that have been analysed, it, it wasn't possible to, to establish a correlation between the types of fittings and the types of books on which they were used. Only with further, uh, more thorough recording and analysis of surviving book fittings on extant bindings may it be possible to begin to see this correlation. In addition, the analysis of uh, monastic library catalogues and contemporary book findings found that the number of book fittings that have been found archaeologically on site is not actually representative of the number of fittings that may have once been used during the late medieval period, making future recording and analysis of fittings found both archaeologically and on extent findings all the more important. 
So by contextually analysing the archaeological material, it was possible to create um, and correlate the various uh, monastic orders and the different forms and decorative styles of book fittings they used. Although this research analysed a sample of material from a small number of monasteries, it was possible to draw some conclusions. <coughs> so whilst this analysis found that no particular type of book fitting or style of decoration was solely utilised by a single monastic order, it demonstrated that particular types of fittings have been found more frequently on sites of certain monastic orders, and that larger numbers of book fittings have been excavated from Cistercian sites. Although the nature of the archaeological investigations that have been previously undertaken at monasteries varies from site to site, from the evaluation of the ideals and practices of different monastic orders, it can be suggested that varying attitudes towards the importance of books and scholarship, and also the ornamentation of monastic furniture, may have influenced um, the numbers and types of book fittings used during the late medieval period. For example, the Cistercians, particularly during the 11th and 12th centuries, had strict attitudes towards the use of ostentatious decoration, especially for the, be uh, the vestments, which did include books. And although Cistercian attitudes re uh, relaxed from the 13th century, the archaeological evidence demonstrated that book fittings from Cistercian sites were particularly simple in form and had little or no decoration. The analysis of the geographical distribution offered the opportunity to examine the regional and patterned use of various types of book fittings and styles of decoration across late medieval England. At a macro level, relatively similar numbers of fittings can, seem, uh, can be shown to have come from sites across the north and south of England. Examining the, detail, uh, the data in more detail, however, did establish that certain types of book fittings were more predominant in areas in certain areas or regions. So within my data set, significant proportions of book fittings were recovered from the southeast and uh, the Yorkshire and Humber regions. The recovery of large numbers of book fittings from several of the richer monasteries that have been noted in the uh, 1535 Valor Ecclesiasticus, uh, such as St Augustine's Abbey, Fountain's Abbey and Battle Abbey, may indicate that they were particularly utilised by some of the wealthier monasteries that typically had uh, significantly larger numbers of books. The substantial evidence, notably documentary and architectural, for the locations in which monastic books were stored and used, with the monastic church, cloister walk, chapter house, refectory and armorium being some of the more typical places. So the analysis of the spatial distribution of book fittings within the monastic complex, of which I've got um, my plan here, um, it found that the location in which some book fittings have been found signify the locations in which they were used and stored. And those excavated from late medieval contexts reflect the casual loss or disposal of book fittings. For example, Book fittings recovered from late medieval rubble and dust layers beneath the choir stalls in the churches of Bordesley Abbey and the, uh, the Dominican Priory at Guildford have been interpreted as having fallen through the floorboards during the daily religious services of the monasteries. In addition, the recovery of book fittings from the late 13th to early 15th century trodden layers within the armarium of Bordesley Abbey can provide artifactual evidence for the location of the storage of monastic book collections and the loss of fittings. From the examination of the deposition of the catalogued artefacts, it was also possible to contribute to the understanding of the destruction of late medieval monastic books, complementing and expanding upon the documentary evidence. It became clear that an important factor in the deposition of a large proportion of book fittings was the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s. The examination of the uh, contemporary written accounts, of which I've just got a couple of quotes at the bottom, they clearly demonstrate that monastic book collections were broken up and their contents often deliberately destroyed. From the analysis of the archaeological material, it's evident that many monastic books were destroyed on site as a large proportion of book fittings were deposited during the first half of the 16th century across various locations within the monastic complex, but most significantly the rear daughter and the church. 
The spatial distribution of these fittings clearly represents the on-site destruction of monastic books that occurred as a result of the dissolution. Despite this though, the analysis of book fittings excavated from monastic sites doesn't provide evidence that for the fate of many monastic books that were dispersed and destroyed away from the monastic complex. Given the large numbers of book fittings, uh, books that were held in many English monasteries and the significant number of book fittings that have been recorded across England through the Portable Antiquities Scheme, it can be suggested that many of these artefacts most likely represent the dispersal, destruction and disposal of monastic books and their fittings away from the monastic houses. So, to summarise, through my analysis of uh, an archaeological assemblage of book fittings, together with support, uh, supporting documentary and pictorial evidence and extant bindings, I've assessed the types of objects that were used on monastic books and, and examined the wider context of books used during the late medieval period. This research not only resulted in a typology that can be used and expanded upon for the future identification and classification of late medieval book fittings, but it also established that a wide variety of fittings were used on monastic books across the collections of different monastic orders in different regions of England. And in addition to understanding the nature of uh, late medieval book fittings, this research found that the analysis of their deposition provided significant evidence for the destruction of monastic books, particularly as part of the dissolution. So today, I hope to have demonstrated how the archaeological investigation of book fittings provides not only the opportunity to uh, study book fittings typologically, but also to place such material into its wider social and cultural context within late medieval English society. Thank you.